This is Long Wave, featuring technical analysis and market analytics by Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. The content of this presentation is strictly the opinion of Gordon T. Long and is based on his analysis, which he feels to be accurate and unbiased. Participants may or may not hold positions in any securities that are discussed. You should always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decisions. Now, let's join Gordon for today's show. Good morning. It is Friday, October the 11th, 2013. I'm Gord Long at GordonTLong.com. As usual, I have a lot of charts for us to go through this morning, so therefore I will pass over some of them quickly, but leave you to examine them further at your leisure. You'll need to open your slide viewer to full screen viewing, or you'll not be able to see some of the detail I'll be discussing. A reminder before we begin, do not trade from any of these slides. They are commentary for educational and discussion purposes only. The purpose of the audio slides is to talk about the areas that are not updated in your monthly analytics and technical analysis report. This is based on our annual cycle as outlined on the subscriptions page of our website. We intentionally keep the technical analysis charts to the subscribers report so as not to confuse them with the drivers operating behind them. Drivers in the long term are primarily the fundamentals, in the intermediate term risk, and in the short term confidence and sentiment. In this regard, I would like to take you on a quick walkthrough of some of the cross currents that we're seeing. Secondly, illustrate a few of the technical shorting signals we're seeing. Thirdly, review preliminary Q3 earnings guidance and results. Fourth, review current market valuations. Fifth, discuss how potential or early shorting may be very dangerous to your financial health. And finally, wrap up with some comments on the current market driver, the shenanigans in Washington. Let's take a quick walk through, as I mentioned, some of the blatant cross currents and divergences being caused by what can only be termed monetary malpractice. The Gallup Economic Confidence Index, shown here, has collapsed. In fact, this is the worst three-week plunge since Lehman Brothers. It is worse than during the 2011 debt ceiling debacle. It is hardly a surprise that the most recent University of Michigan consumer sentiment slumped to its lowest since January, having fallen three months in a row. This is the second monthly miss in a row and the biggest three-month drop in 25 months. Both appear to confirm the cyclical turn we've been discussing here for a number of months. However, compare this to the relentless rise in the Russell 2000 index. Remember, the exuberance of price earnings multiple expansions relies on an ever-rising confidence of investors to continue to lift it. The University of Michigan consumer sentiment is more reflective of the lack of employment opportunities and the pressures on real disposable incomes, even by those who do have full-time jobs. It is a completely different picture for corporate profits, which are off the scale from a historical perspective as labor has been squeezed through benefit reduction, labor arbitrage, and an ever-expanding automation process. But things are not as rosy as the corporate profit picture would indicate. Credit markets, specifically in high yield, are diverging from the S&P, as is the U.S. macro index. This has been going on for a while and usually is well correlated. They are signaling that the fundamental underpinnings of the market are weak. The confusing cross currents are by no means unique to the U.S. economy. The global GDP forecasts continue to be reduced, which implies revenue and earnings pressures on the Dow and the S&P 500 corporations. These pressures have been temporarily camouflaged by cost-cutting and creative accounting, but corporate chief financial officers are quickly running out of runway. Everything apparently looked good in August when Goldman's global leading indicator, the GLI Swirligram, had recovered quickly from a growth scare in Q1 and was holding firmly in expansion territory. Then reality hit as new orders, less inventories worsened, global manufacturing and PMI surveys rolled over, industrial metals gave up gains, and Korean exports, for example, provided no help at all. 
Among the few factors holding up the index from already plunging levels was the Baltic Dry Index, which has subsequently collapsed, and consumer confidence, which, as we just discussed, appears also to be rolling over. September's plunge in, into slowdown for the GLI is the biggest drop in eight months. As you would surmise from all of this, the consensus earnings estimates must be witnessing pressures to reflect it. With little attention, they have. Like a thief in the night, they have been steadily reduced. Recently, however, they have noticeably increased their rate of reduction as the obscene year-end hockey stick must now be removed quietly under the media glare of debt ceiling and budget wrangling coverage. This is nothing new. It is the way of Wall Street as can be seen on the historical patterns of consensus earnings growth forecasts, but it has become even more distorted recently, if, if that is possible. We have been warning of an earnings recession, and if you can turn off CNBS, you'll be able to see it quite visibly. The recent sell-off associated with Washington's wrangling has taken the markets to critical support levels. In a number of cases, they have broken key technical support. The Dow, though having bounced off its 200-day moving average, has seen its 50 DMA cross its 100 DMA. This death cross is something taken seriously by technical traders. Additionally, the S&P 500 has broken through its 11-month trendline support. As stocks press back towards all-time highs amid, one, a U.S. government shutdown, two, extreme weaknesses in earnings pre-announcements, three, slower-than-expected China growth, four, Europe's recovery being in doubt, and five, an extended debt ceiling debate in the United States, we should consider four big-picture charts of dismal divergences that suggest it's not different this time at all. There is negative divergences in the new 52-week highs. Additionally, we have triple bearish divergence on the percentage of New York Stock Exchange stocks above their 200-day moving averages. A reading below 60% on the percentage of New York Stock Exchange stocks above the 200-day moving average would provide a warning for U.S. equities. The percentage of New York Stock Exchange stocks above their 200-day moving averages has a strong bearish divergence similar to the divergences that preceded pullbacks in mid 2010 and mid to late 2011. This points to diminishing momentum for market breadth and preceded pullbacks in the range of 15 to 20 percent of 2010 and 2011. Both daily and weekly MACD and RSI suggested weaker price momentum as the S&P moved to new highs above 1700 in early August and mid-September. This is corroborating the bearish divergence on the percentage of NYSE stocks above 200-day moving averages. The last time both weekly and daily momentum had bearish divergences was in mid-2011. In 2011, the S&P 500 corrected nearly 20% from an April peak to an October low. The S&P 500 has three higher highs, while weekly MACD and RSI remains in downtrends off those S&P 500 highs. This is a potential triple bearish divergence. Weekly MACD has not yet reversed its sell signal. Margin debt is contrarian bearish. Using closing basis monthly data, peaks in NYSE margin debt preceded peaks in the S&P 500 in 2007 and 2000. The March 2000 peak in NYSE margin debt of 279 million preceded the August 2000 monthly closing price peak in the S&P 500 at 1518. The July 2007 margin debt peak of 381 million preceded the October 2007 monthly closing price peak of 1550 for the S&P 500. Margin debt reached a record high of 384 million in April and the S&P 500 continued to rally into July, August, and September. This is a similar setup to the 2007 and 2000. Going back to January 1959, margin debt and the S&P have moved together for the most part, but leverage is a double-edged sword and can be exasperated during sell-offs, leading to deeper-than-expected market pullbacks. 
Still think the market is driven by earnings or fundamentals? Or just leverage and marginal credit expansions, like, for example, shadow banking repos? The chart on the right overlays the two series. It is about as good a fit as you're going to get. If anything was to startle this closely correlated market, then we can expect a stampede. Right now, that stampede would be out of stocks, but it could just as easily be into stocks as we saw with a 500-point upward move in the Dow in 48 hours, simply on speculation that Washington talks were becoming somewhat more positive. Another strong correlation can be found between the S&P 500 and hedge fund returns. It has never been higher and is approaching one. Another correlation offering the same sort of risks. It is somewhat surprising that the Treasury agreed. In a startling recent report, they were quite vocal in, in stating, and I quote, This herding into popular assets by asset managers could pose a threat to the U.S. financial system. End of quote. What is happening is that the hedge fund managers have become high-cost version of their index-tracking ETF brethren. Meanwhile, performance advantages have simply dwindled. As Stan Druckenmiller previously noted on why hedge fund managers are less successful, and again I quote, There are too many. There were 8 to 10 back then. Somehow 9,000 people are pricing their product off of 8 to 10 people's historic performance. I noticed a lot of the smart early investors and hedge fund clients were leaving, but they were more than replaced by state pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and so far they have been perfectly happy to get returns that our early investors would have just simply never tolerated. End of quote. An important piece of work was recently published by Bill Gross, the founder and co-chief investment officer of PIMCO, the largest bond fund in the world. He spelled out that deleveraging has barely begun and that bond yields have yet to test their eventual lows. As you are all well aware, I have written many times that as part of the ongoing macroprudential policy of financial repression, we can likely expect 10-year U.S. Treasury bonds to eventually, and I say eventually, fall below 1%. It is nice to feel finally not so all alone in this call, though my call is simply one of technical overlaid on the macro uh, situation. Time, of course, will tell. I don't for a moment believe that taper can politically be implemented. Deleveraging is not typically good for equity markets. I had noted market commentator Lance Roberts on macro analytics a couple of times now. He's quite clear, as these charts show, that the equity markets are levitating on flows based on current monetary policy any change or even a hint of reduction in equity markets fall. Lance points out corporate top-line revenues continue to deteriorate as stock prices continue to climb. This simply cannot be sustained over an extended period of time. Measures of economic output, such as the Output Composite Index, indicate a worrying trend. This is yet another signal of troubling times ahead for equities. I won't go into detail regarding the next two charts. The mechanics behind them are outlined in the study section of this month's MATA report. Secular bull and bear markets are periods driven by longer term trends in the inflation rate. A trend away from low inflation, whether to high inflation or deflation, drives the value of the market lower. The return trip, when the inflation rate tends towards low inflation, drives the value of the market higher. We are currently quite early in the current secular bear market. I show this monthly in real terms in your MATA report. What I don't show is that the economy experiences periods of rising inflation, disinflation, that is declining inflation, deflation, i.e. negative inflation, reflation, i.e. increasing inflation inside of deflation, and price stability, that is low stable inflation. The periods run in a natural sequence around the starting point of price stability. If history is a guide, the inflation rate will at some point trend away from the present price stability. The result will be significant declining trend in price earnings. If this occurs over a few years, the market losses will be dramatic. More likely, it will take a decade or longer. That will enable the underlying economy and baseline earnings to grow, 
thereby offsetting the decline in price earnings. As we've seen from history, that means another decade or longer of near zero returns. Not good for the 75 million American baby boomers beginning to retire. When the adverse inflation rate trend reaches its nadir, we will mark the end of the secular bear and the start of the next secular bull. As the economy or the Fed reverses the adverse inflation rate trend back towards price stability, PE will trough at its lows and begin the long climb that drives secular bull markets. These processes take many years. U.S. companies are warning about Q3 earnings at the second highest level since 2001, with estimates well below what they were just three short months ago. Of course, the U.S. equity markets don't care. Having rallied aggressively in the face of this collapse, lubricated by multiple expanding QE and reverse repos, as Reuters reported, and I quote, companies issuing negative outlooks outnumber positive ones by 5.2 to 1, the most negative since the 6.3 to 1 ratio in the second quarter, when, however, the second half recovery which has been, once again, indefinitely de delayed, perhaps to the third half, was said would take place momentarily and lead to another mythical rebound. Industrials, materials, and tech top the list for negative pre-announcements. End of quote from Reuters, no less. The third quarter earnings for S&P companies were expected to increase by 4.6% compared with a year ago down from a forecast of 8.5% on July 1st. Technology is the sector with the highest number of third quarter negative outlooks, with 27 warnings. Among them was Autodesk Inc., which anticipates lower demand for its computer-aided design software used in construction, manufacturing, engineering. Consumer discretionary companies have the second highest number of warnings, including the Target Corporation, Target said in August that shoppers remained cautious and its new Canadian stores were not doing as well as anticipated, for example. And we've talked about Walmart and their concerns and their cutbacks with Christmas um, or stocking orders. There's a lot of noise right now that's driving sector performance, and it's not fundamentals. The complete disconnect between corporate profitability and forward earnings has been well documented. But just in case someone had forgotten, here it is again. Through the magic of multiple expansions, stocks remain at all-time highs and are pitched as cheap because multiples can still get bigger. Remember March 2000, 25.6 times P.E.? There is only one thing wrong with that dream. No matter how hard the Fed tries, mistakenly, as we've noted here many times, to pump the economy full of money to make consumers feel good and ignite the wealth effect, consumer sentiment has hit a wall. And it's all about confidence. Investors will not be willing to pay increasing multiples unless they are confident that the future streams of earnings are sustainable and forecastable. And simply put, the current levels of consumer sentiment need to almost double for the U.S. equity market to approach historical multiple valuation levels. Overall, consumer sentiment is at levels that typically have marked crises over the last 30 years. And that, that chart is in your monthly MATA document report every single month showing it. We go into this in a lot more detail in our study section, actually, this particular chart on valuations in, again, this month's MATA report. The equity market has discounted a large portion of any improved outlook that the always optimistic sell side strategists believe is just around the corner. As Barclays notes, and again I quote, we have just witnessed the largest two-year expansion of PE multiples since the late 90s. This bubble of optimism sparked by a repressive Fed policy combined with historical valuation metrics that are above their long-term averages implies a correction and a period of consolidation is likely to plague the U.S. equity markets during the first half of 2014. The improved outlook is fully discounted in share prices. 
given that historical valuation metrics are above their long-term averages, it is difficult to make a case to the contrary. End of quote. This is Barclays. Notice who I'm going through. These are mainstream institutions that are now on a fairly negative a bandwagon, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later. This is highly unusual. Usually they're always on the positive side. As negative as the financial indicators and technical analytics are, I suspect I will likely surprise our many new subscribers by telling you I have come to the conclusion that the markets are actually headed higher in the intermediate term. I won't take you through the technical charts which supports this conclusion. You can see those in the October MATA report. But rather, I would like to give you a big picture macro view. What differentiates the work at GordonTLong.com is that we combine detailed technical analytics with the identification of the macro drivers and triggers. It often gives us a perspective that allows us to better interpret the technicals and how the global pool of algo computers will actually re react. Our high probability trading zone statistics available at Triggers bears this out quite well. We are presently in the midst of a very disruptive economic calendar of events. The U.S. budget and debt ceiling negotiations that have resulted in a U.S. government shutdown are obviously affecting all markets both domestically and abroad. There are serious event risks at play that affect the 800 pound gorilla bond and currency markets. Major equity market moves usually align with turmoil in these sister markets. Presently, confusion reigns. If you are having a hard time making sense out of what's going on in Washington regarding the government shutdown and the debt ceiling, trying to make sense out of investor sentiment is not going to be any easier. These charts show the weekly readings of bullish and bearish sentiment from the American Association of Individual Investors. Double A, double I. As shown in the top chart, even as the stock market has been steadily declining, bullish sentiment has actually increased, rising above 37.8% up to 41.3%. Meanwhile, bullish sentiment rose this week. So did bearish sentiment. As illustrated in the lower chart, bearish sentiment rose from 30 up to 33.6%. It is not too often that you see a period where both bearish and bullish sentiment rise by three or more percentage points in the same week. In fact, as Bespoke points out, this is their chart, the last time it happened was back in May 2009, just as we were coming out of the bear market. However, when you have a market where prices move on headlines or even rumors of possible meetings, you can't blame investors for being confused. We need to keep our perspective on how the stock market tends to perform after a government shutdown ends. And unfortunately, we have lots of statistics on that one. This chart plots the average S&P 500 performance for the 20 trading days, approximately one calendar month, before and 60 trading days, approximately three calendar months, after a government shutdown ends. The stock market has tended to struggle prior to the end of a government shutdown, obviously, due to the fact that investors fear the unknown. Following this, the stock market has, on average, trended higher over the ensuing three months in what amounts to a relief rally. This chart is an average performance chart, and following the last 17 shutdowns, the stock market traded up 60 trading days after shutdown ended on 12 of 17 occasions, specifically 70.5% of the time. We also need to be aware of seasonality interpretations. Assuming the Washington stress that's been weighing on the market starts to diminish, the seasonality factor may add some significant upward momentum bias after earnings disappointments also get out of the way. September is historically the market's worst month of the year, yet stocks soared last month, so we need to be a little cautious on relying too heavily on this factor. But it does remind me that fund managers' bonuses and performance statistics are critically important to Wall Street. Never underestimate Wall Street's ability to put lipstick on a pig. For a number of months now, I have pointed out that patterns and Elliott wave counts suggest we need to see an alternation pattern occur before a final top is put in. 
This calls for a period, in this case, of flat, though volatile, stock market movement as basically the markets move sideways. This is clearly shown in a number of patterns, but one of particular interest to me is the NYSE's cumulative advanced decline line. We have a very clear rising triangle consolidation pattern, exactly the concept alternation is predicting as the highest probability outcome here. And we had this prediction four months ago, if not longer. There is a very strong chance that even from these higher elevated levels and extremely elevated levels, we actually are about to have a bear trap sprung. Shorting this market is simply too obvious when even my barber tells me the market's rise makes no sense and must correct. Correcting markets almost always occur when my barber tells me why the markets are going to keep going up. We have too many people here, including the sell side analysts, including the mainstream media, getting on the same side of this negative boat. Now, the macroeconomics of why the markets are headed higher that I mentioned earlier. The driver is the Japanese carry trade. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's Abenomics has reignited Japanese carry trade as a falling yen is as high a probability as you can get. The global markets are responding accordingly and will continue to in an accelerating fashion. Additionally, the recent emerging market crisis has scared central banks into the realities of a potential echo boom that exposes the global economy as it clearly continues to slow. Printing money is the only stopgap solution available to them. Expect as the global economies get sicker and the fear of a U.S. recession surface as Christmas shopping becomes a major disappointment that a global abonomics program comes into being in some form. The current World Bank IMF um, IIF meeting in Washington, the word out of that this week is indicative that the re that realization is sinking in to most of the inside crowd at that particular meeting. Remember, cheap money, continued flows, and lots of liquidity means leverage and margin. Leverage is what is driving the U.S. market. We are in the early stages, in my mind, of a von Mises crack-up boom. There are signs of this all around us. I pointed out a number of them in the most recent Trigger Webzine release, which is available free at Triggers, as well in recent macro analytics tapes on how the globalization trap, which we've talked about previously, is now an integral part of that crack-up boom. The U.S. dollar will be the last fiat currency to fall, and as such, the perceived flight to safety will be the U.S. dollar-based assets. They're the least ugly at the beauty pageant. This conceptual schematic in nominal terms uh, shows what I think is happening and where we're at right now. In real terms, the collapse is all actually already underway. Talk to the gutted middle class in America for proof on that point that the collapse is already underway. As more and more countries get into serious difficulties like we've seen in Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Turkey, we can go around the world as we're seeing in the, the I refer to them as the faulty five or the fragile five most recently in Indonesia, India, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, and you'll see it broaden as it gets into other peripheral countries. I'm expecting it in Central and Eastern Europe. That flight of quality will go to the United States, which I believe will force up U.S. equities for a little longer period of time, at least into the spring of 2014 right now. I believe that the current corrective action that we've been going through, which is shown in the bottom left of this graph, the CD, is nearing completion or very, very close to completion. There's actually a chance that it may have actually be in right now. But then we have this final E wave that I'm referring to as this uh, crack up boom takes its course. There are 52 examples in history of, um, of a hyperinflation crack up boom. And in most cases, the crack up booms were very short term. They were measured in days and weeks, few of them in many months, some of them as much as 12 to 14 months. So my assessment is this is something that will last probably into the, as I said, the spring. In closing, I'd like to take a moment as a reminder 
Do not trade from any of these slides. They are for educational and discussion purposes only. Thank you for listening, and until next month, may 2013 be an outstanding investment year for you, and you'll be well prepared for what I see coming in 2014. Thank you for listening. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.